What's important to you? Is it important to me? Who will it be important to in the future? My name is Suzette Mead. Sometimes I'm called a lobbyist, a NIMBY, an innovator, an activist, a protector and an advocate, and to some, a troublemaker. I proudly wear all these hats. We should never be pigeonholed into one title. Diversity and agility in advocacy is the only way to remain current and effective. If we continue to preach to the converted and not invite new ways of thinking, then we risk the chance of diminishing the number of new ears that will hear our stories and we will stunt the growth of a campaign or a cause. To keep a campaign growing and progressing, to make sure the next generation are ready to carry the torch of advocacy, it is imperative that we engage the wider community now. What defines us as a community? Its past or its future? Why can't it be both? Heritage defines our desire to keep things we cherish for future generations. Heritage forms part of our communal DNA. Therefore, it is part of who we are as a community. It's what we have in common and comes a part of our identity and part of our social glue. So it's worth fighting for. Whether we like it or not, population density is coming like a freight train and once was suburban is becoming urban. Whether we like it or not, heritage advocates or community campaigners must now not only battle for the why a place is historically significant, socially or environmentally important to preserve, we are now being asked to provide evidence for its fiscal value to society and how its heritage significance should outweigh the return the government could gain from the sale of its site. Some very significant cases in point in the media currently is the serious building in the rocks, which is being fought to be saved by the community, social housing organisations, with the National Trust, the New South Wales Heritage Council and the Australian Institute of Architects. Most recently, the CFMEU, who have placed the second green ban on the rocks to protect it from the government development against public outcry. This story has received a lot of media and my family and I also marched side by side with the Green Banners last month from Customs House to the Sirius Building with around 1,500 other supporters. But this story of communities having to fight to battle a real estate return versus heritage significance is happening all over Sydney, New South Wales and the entire country. Why is it up to the community to prove why a heritage place should be preserved? Shouldn't it be the responsibility of the government to prove why it isn't important to keep? So how have the North Parramatta Residents Action Group attempted to achieve this? When NPRAG were formed in January 2015, it was under the steam of a very small group of 25 or so concerned residents that would be directly affected by the state government's proposal by the government development arm, Urban Growth, to rezone 30 hectares of public land currently used by correctional services and area health in the Cumberland Hospital grounds. Most people in Parramatta are totally unaware of what lies hidden between the Parramatta Leeds Club and the Parramatta Jail in North Parramatta, or that the state government plans under the government proposals will overshadow this heritage with 24, 12, 8, 16, 10 and 14 storey residential apartment buildings. Effectively, a solid wall that will block a potential open vista. The proposal will divide the Cumberland Hospital grounds into 25 super lots for private residential development, now permitted due to an approval from the Minister for Planning for up to 6,500 units beside the World Heritage Worthy Parramatta Female Factory. The government's claim is that this is the only way to fund the critical work to restore the heritage buildings in the Parramatta Female Factory precinct to sell all the open space to private residential development, when in fact they will be really making over $1 billion on the sale towards funding other things like a bigger football stadium two kilometres down the road, which is likely to put into jeopardy the vistas of the World Heritage listed old government house. Meanwhile, in Macquarie Street, a proposal is underway to create a heritage tourism precinct with no likelihood of Hyde Park or the domain being sold off for residential infill 
to fund the project. Just one and a half kilometres from the Parramatta CBD is a precinct running along Parramatta River, so rich and diverse in narratives from the Darug custodians of the land through to colonisation in 1788. There are so many magnificent buildings dating back to 1818, as well as buildings that were built as the asylum expanded into the 19th and 20th century. Some of the great architects of New South Wales designed many of the buildings here in North Parramatta. Francis Greenway, James Barnett, who designed the Sydney GPO, George McRae, who designed the Queen Victoria Building, and Walter Liberty Vernon. Today's Cumberland Hospital began as the Female Factory, an initiative of Governor Macquarie. It was built between 1818 and 1821 for the female convicts of the colony, who were at the time housed in a wooden building in Parramatta, and it wasn't big enough for them. Many of the women left roaming in the streets at night, leading to those like the Reverend Samuel Marsden, calling them whores, as they had to exchange sexual favours for things like food and shelter. So Governor Macquarie decided to do something about that and constructed a large institution. It was basically a prison, but it was based on the Protestant work ethic, which is why it was called a factory. The factory was a place of confinement, a workhouse, a marriage bureau, a hospital and a refuge to around 5,000 convict women. Over 30,000 girls were admitted to the Parramatta Industrial School, known to many as the Norma Parker Centre, from 1886 to 1974. Within this institution, girls were often subjected to systematic emotional, physical and sexual abuse. In the last 40 years, this precinct has served to provide mental health services in New South Wales, public land as it began, to serve those most vulnerable in society. The narratives here are endless. The narratives are all unique, but in a way, they are all connected. Why was the message not getting through to the community? Our first campaign was to bring wider awareness to this hidden sacrosanct site and what it was under threat from with the government's plan to create a new high-density suburb. As this precinct is still to this day a working mental health facility, many people are not aware of its historical significance to our nation's beginnings. The first thing our committee did was to make contact with existing advocates in the area who have been working tirelessly for decades. The Parramatta Female Factory Friends, the Parramatta Female Factory Precinct Memory Project, the National Trust of New South Wales, Parramatta Branch, the Parramatta Historical Society and the Granville Historical Society. Each one of these groups provide a very important service into retaining the fabric of our past. We, as a community group representing residents, needed to integrate this wealth of knowledge into the wider community. For the main, most of the community are not experts in built or social heritage and the majority have no interest to change that. So it's vital to turn these stories of the past into quick and easily digestible interest stories for the public. We mobilised fast and letterboxed over 7,000 homes in Parramatta, inviting them to attend a community rally one rainy Saturday afternoon in February 2015. We invited local historians, heritage groups, to set up information tables and speak to the 180 strong crowd. Almost all that turned up had not been aware of the heritage in the area and certainly had no idea of the state government's plans to create a suburb on top of it. Like most state significant projects, the government released the proposal that was thousands of pages long with a four week response period over Christmas. Making heritage advocacy accessible. In Parramatta, where over 57% of the population recorded in the 2011 census were born overseas, it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion that they will feel a sense of place, a sense of connection, and certainly not engaged to the narratives to be actively involved in its protection. So how do we, as a community group, evolve our advocacy to engage a wider demographic in our community? Engage in groups that may not necessarily be interested in the history, but perhaps another component of the area that would draw them to participate into protecting its future existence. We have a diverse group of members, supporters and residents. Not all are connected to the one in seven Australians descended from the women of the female factory, 
So we have to think, how will this development affect their everyday life? Most already live in high density dwellings, so the loss of public space, green space, is a loss of their backyard. So our campaign will often shift when we target certain demographics and suburbs to what we think would likely be the element that would connect them to the precinct. Click activism, digital advocacy. In the world of click advocacy, where we are increasingly time poor but information rich, how do we engage the greater population and the next generation in being advocates for a building or a bridge, a forest that they feel they currently have no connection to? While social media has changed the way we can reach wider audiences in record speed, it has also made it harder and harder to get commitment more than a Facebook like or a share or to sign a change.org petition. Facebook and Twitter are a major form of connecting to a wider audience, but it takes skill to be able to make someone stop. Once you have made them stop, you have to stop them from clicking to the next page. Visuals, catchy slogans, links to videos with more information are your best chance of getting a message across to a wider audience. Sharing information with groups outside your interest group, perhaps with architecture, environmental organisations, artists, universities, will help your message grow to be outside the square. Print media takes a lot of work to be included week in and week out. Once they have run a story a few times, they will ignore you unless you have a new angle. Journalists are increasingly under the pump to create endless online stories for weekly or daily print. They don't want to investigate or find storylines themselves. Building a relationship with reporters and supplying them the hook and the background information is the only way to get their attention. Being accessible to provide a quote within an hour, providing photo opportunities, all go towards making you someone they need, not the other way around. In 18 months, the North Parramatta Residents Action Group have media our strong focus in our campaigns. From the first nine months of our Press Pause campaign to now our Solution Seeker campaign for a better vision. We've managed to push our cause in some way or another to appear in over a year and a half in 48 online or printed local papers and national press. We've been interviewed around five times on primetime news and successfully lobbied the ABC for a documentary on the Australia Wide program, which featured the National Trust, as well as the Parramatta Female Factory Friends. Politics and community advocacy. There is no escaping the challenges of community activism without being political. It's a dance, government and community. Sometimes a waltz, sometimes a tango, or perhaps a rave. Often the community feel like a wallflower, excluded from the government's dance, but at least able to wait on the side of the dance floor and hope for an invitation to join. I know a lot of NP RAG's success to date has come from being agile and swift to react to the government as it becomes more and more organised and creates stronger lobby groups for developers. Forming peak unelected bodies to push planning reforms with the Greater Sydney Commission and Urban Growth, who I like to call Landcom on steroids, is a full-time job, just trying to keep up with the fast-tracked policy changing. Considering this, it is paramount that volunteer groups are networking and banding together. Finding common aims and goals and interconnecting our resources, sharing the hard to find pool of committed volunteers, creating a bank of contacts, a wealth of ideas. Maintaining a constant surge of momentum together is the only way to be heard. We've made submissions and given evidence to two upper house parliamentary inquiries in just three months. The first inquiry into the mismanagement of Crown land in New South Wales and the second most recently was the inquiry into museums and gallery funding. We took this opportunity to promote the need for the creation of the Museum of New South Wales, a museum of migration, a museum of Indigenous excellence, and an art gallery of Western Sydney. All of this to be created instead of importing narratives from other communities in Sydney. We lobbied hard to the members of this inquiry committee and were successful in them adding a tour 
to the Parramatta Female Factory Precinct and the entire Cumberland Hospital grounds to their schedule. Keeping in the face of politicians is tiresome but necessary. Disappointingly, the ones in power ignore us, so we're in constant contact with shadow ministers for planning, heritage, environment, tourism and business. We give tours of the precinct and provide them with constant information for arguments in Parliament and to promote better ideas. Community coalitions. The North Parramatta Residents Group were formed from outrage of a fast track development to turn heritage into a suburb. We may not be experts on heritage, on environment or planning, but we were organised and enthusiastic. It seemed the most sensible approach was to connect to those with the knowledge so that we could learn and grow. The Parramatta Chamber of Commerce have been very supportive of the community campaign. This has purely been down to the professional solution-seeking campaign we have been running. Our committee have made presentations to the Chamber's board very early on, outlining the long-term economic and social benefits of turning the Cumberland Hospital Heritage Grounds in North Parramatta into Western Sydney's home of arts and culture shared with a heritage tourist site. They immediately understood the benefits this would bring to the area for existing and new business. Having the business sector on side is a big support and promotes our credibility to further our community vision. In February this year, after working together for almost a year, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the Parramatta Female Factory Friends. This was a very important moment to show the government that there is a united force in the community with heritage groups together advocating for better outcomes. I believe having the community behind a push for public retention and funding for heritage is pivotal in becoming an issue the government must listen to and act on. Working together with the Parramatta Female Factory Friends, we have become twice as knowledgeable, twice as powerful and twice as effective. Together we have been attending festivals like Australia Day and the Wisteria Festival with joint stalls. This is a very powerful presentation to the community and to the government. We're able to work to each other's strengths and weaknesses. Where NP RAG volunteers might not have the answer to specific heritage questions, the women in the female factory can pass this on. The same is said for any matters relating to planning law, policy and government, where NP RAG can adeptly answer these queries. It's a symbiotic relationship that serves both parties well. We also made an alliance in April this year with a group from the inner city to the shock of many. A divide was being made between the east and the west of Sydney suburbs with a proposal being put through to relocate the Ultimo Powerhouse Museum to Parramatta. We used this media plug to our advantage and have been running an East Joins West campaign. The Powerhouse Alliance and the North Parramatta Residents Action Group have put our collective heads together and decided to join forces to push our campaigns together for better outcomes for both communities. We've invited the Powerhouse Alliance, which included local and internationally renowned curators, to tour the entire 30 hectares of the Fleet Street Heritage Precinct. This also included the member for Sydney, Alex Greenwich, and the Greens, Jamie Parker. After the tour, we held a roundtable discussion on how our campaign could be combined to lobby for best outcomes for both communities' cultural futures. We have used this alliance as a way to bring a bigger spotlight on better visions for Parramatta's cultural future instead of transplanting a cultural institution removed from another community, only to allow the demolition and sale of the site in Ultimo. This controversial alliance was introduced our campaign to create a much needed cultural precinct to the Parramatta City to a potential audience of thousands from the inner city as well as many vital contacts within the cultural industry. Solution seekers. The government has always had a predetermined outcome for this 30 hectares of heritage land in Parramatta for housing. Their own reports in 2012 labelled the Cumberland Hospital grounds which include the Parramatta Female Factory as surplus to government need. We've spent eight months demanding the government to press pause to allow for better outcomes to be discussed with a wider and more transparent stakeholder engagement, but we were continually ignored. We decided that if we were going to continue to be ignored, then we needed to create an alternative solution to present to the government. 
in August 2015, we approached the CFMEU about extending the existing green ban of 9 hectares, which is on the heritage buildings of the Parramatta female factory, to cover a further 20 hectares that the heritage precinct is nestled in. This is the space that needs to be saved. This is the green space that the government want to sell off to private developers to create a new suburb. The CFMEU heard the residents' concerns, the green banners from Jack Mundy and the BLF era originally formed to stand up for residents when their pleas were falling on deaf ears. Again, on the 27th of August 2015, announced that a green ban would be extended to cover the entire Cumberland Hospital precinct not allowing inappropriate development that was not supported by the community. At the announcement of the Green Ban, we decided to take a big step. Now we had everyone's attention, we would do what the government had failed to do themselves. We would hold a symposium to discuss better ideas for the precinct in five weeks time. Our committee of five worked feverishly to put together a list of invitees and source revenue and funding to pull off a professional event with influential speakers and panellists. The Fleet Street Heritage Precinct Symposium, supported by the National Trust of Australia and the Parramatta Female Factory Friends, was held in the auditorium at the Parramatta Leagues Club with around 85 participants to discuss better ideas for one of Australia's most significant heritage sites. We invited academics in planning, heritage conservation, politicians, urban growth New South Wales, the community, historians, artists, the Chamber of Commerce, Parramatta councillors. Guest speakers included representatives from the successful Abbotsford convent in Victoria, who NP RAG flew up from Melbourne to tell the success story of how they turned a government decision to sell the Victorian buildings and grounds to a residential developer. Instead, due to an alliance with the community and businesses and pledges from philanthropic fields, a freehold arrangement has been set up to keep these grounds in public hands and has now delivered Australia's largest arts precinct. In May this year, we found a mint condition board game featuring Parramatta's businesses and heritage sites called Parramatta Your Town. This was used as a major fundraising raffle, but most importantly as a media campaign with local papers to promote how underutilised heritage tourism is in Parramatta. We are currently underway with creating a modern day version of this game, focusing on the history of Parramatta and hope to partner with the Chamber of Commerce in delivering this board game which will educate and promote our city's unique heritage. This year we also managed to locate a Third Reich era film on the Parramatta Female Factory called Zünnüren Ufen, Two New Shores. Produced by German film studios in 1937, this story tells of an 1840s English woman wrongly convicted of forgery and transported across the globe to the Parramatta Female Factory. We thought that this was a chance to engage not only with Parramatta heritage buffs, but a cross promotion to German cultural organisations through social pages like Meetup, with cinematography groups and language groups. This film event was to highlight the importance of the Parramatta Female Factory's application for national heritage listing and further advocacy towards World Heritage Listing with UNESCO. With the assistance of the Parramatta Heritage Centre, we produced small information bags containing brochures on places to visit. We invited the National Trust to include a promotion for their exhibition of the time, Mrs Fisher's Murder Mystery Costumes, at Old Government House. Most importantly, we provided patients with copies of our MOU partner, Parramatta Female Factory's petition to everyone that attended. As a result, hundreds of copies of the petitions were distributed and signed. We were also fortunate to have two very special guest speakers to address the audience pre-screening. Professor Carol Liston from the University of Western Sydney spoke about the area's importance to colonisation and lecturer James Finlay from the University of Sydney who travelled to Germany to study the sets and stories behind this film. We were a few seats short of filling the 200 person venue at the Riverside Theatre and felt this was a significant turning point to us reaching the wider public. So where to from here? Without visuals, it's hard to sell a dream. So after thousands of sausage sandwiches sold at three Bunnings barbecues, donations from the public, endless raffle tickets and profits from our movie screening, 
we were able to start hiring professional planners to conceptualise our alternative vision for the 30 hectares of public land to become New South Wales' best and biggest arts and cultural precinct. At the Fleet Street Heritage Precinct Symposium held last year, the event speakers, including Brian Powyer, Vice President of the National Trust Australia, President of the Parramatta Chamber of Commerce, Michael Mkhitaryan, and Professor Peter Phibbs from the University of Sydney, all identified a common theme, that this precinct could deliver so much more for Western Sydney other than simply high density residential. In particular, there was a unanimous agreement that an international arts and cultural precinct at North Parramatta would have a large multiplier effect on Western Sydney and over the longer term would make a stronger economic case for the benefits it would bring to Australia's next great city. Further, given a plan for growing Sydney is intended to deliver housing for 900,000 residents in Western Sydney within 15 years, it makes the retention of this public land and open space adjoining Parramatta Park vital. Not only would the precinct offer far greater economic benefit over the longer term, but it would also provide the opportunity for greater physical and mental well-being for local communities, as well as historical, cultural and social value to the larger Sydney population. The Fleet Street Heritage Precinct as a new cultural arts precinct would be the first for Western Sydney, providing a celebration of Indigenous and colonial narratives in a single and contiguous heritage precinct. The opportunities for this site, free of residential development, are many. They could include a heritage and museum zone, an arts and theatre zone, a unique Indigenous arts and technology hub, and a riverside dining precinct surrounded by a sculpture park. It would be the starting point for a cultural ribbon linking Parramatta to the CBD by Sydney's waterway, with the opportunity to incorporate smaller cultural precincts and future urban renewal along the Bays Precinct and other urban renewal areas along Parramatta River. The precinct would provide thousands of ongoing jobs and an increasing income stream from domestic and international tourism. As such, it would stimulate the local economy with a diverse income base and flow onto the larger New South Wales economy. The Fleet Street Heritage Precinct would become an international destination and also provide Western Sydney with a world-class cultural precinct. Further, the precinct's introduction would attract new communities and business economies. In turn, this would encourage additional investment to Parramatta, creating more vibrant communities and greater employment and economic growth. In short, it would become an incredible legacy to the people of New South Wales and indeed our nation. The introduction of a trust is proposed to manage this precinct. Our proposal prohibits any residential construction within the confines of the Cumberland Hospital East Campus grounds. All open spaces in the Fleet Street Heritage Precinct should remain in public ownership under the custody, control and management of a trust known as the Fleet Street Heritage Precinct Trust or similar. Our campaign is racing against the clock. Our aim is to present a sound business proposal in front of the government that will change the future of Parramatta's Heritage Precinct in a positive way instead of negative. We are currently planning on forming a peak reference group on Parramatta's tourism strategy, with its main focus being the Fleet Street Heritage Precinct. We hope that this initiative will include members of the business community as well as heritage, tourism and the arts sector. I am humbled and enormously grateful for the opportunity to speak with the Royal Australian Historical Society Conference. Thank you.